If you're a programmer, you've probably used ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot to help you with your work, and it's been very helpful most times, or at least for me it has, but you'll notice that the bigger your project gets, the less useful it becomes. Imagine this scenario. You're about to implement a new feature in a large code base that you've never really touched before. If the code base was the size of a simple Python script, you could paste all of that into GPT-4 and ask as many questions as you would need. But of course, you could also just read over it yourself because if it's that short, you don't really need GPT-4. Still, when you go to a bigger code base, like a Java code base that's really verbose, you can't paste all that into GPT-4, which sucks, because you're gonna get an error that says this conversation is too long or something like that, and you won't be able to get any assistance out of GPT-4 at all. This is because ChatGPT and large language models in general can only take in so much text at once, yet there are products like Kodi by Sourcegraph and the Cursor Code Editor that seem to have gotten around this problem and allow AI to be able to assist you over large multi-file projects. So clearly there's a way to solve this problem, but how do we do it? To solve this problem and make a better AI coding assistant, we only needed to answer one question. How do we give this AI model more memory so that it can be a better code assistant? Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you might remember when I made an AI search engine for my YouTube channel. And if you're particularly intelligent, you might be realizing, hey, isn't this kind of the same problem? And it is. With my AI search engine, I was making sure that the AI could look up all the relevant information for my YouTube videos and now we need to be able to make sure that the large language model can look up all the relevant information from a large code base. And when I was doing it with the YouTube videos, we were using something called vector embeddings. And what vector embeddings basically are is a way to turn text into some sort of a list of floats that the computer will be able to understand and take in as input. In fact, this is how large language models take in input, but that's not all they're good for. They're also good for kind of representing the semantic meaning of a word. For example, Python and Anaconda mean kind of similar things. They're both different types of snakes. So when you convert both of these into vector embeddings, you're gonna get two lists of numbers that are pretty similar if you compare them. And what we really are doing here is using something called cosine similarity, which basically just measures how similar these lists are. And if you wanna think about it a little bit more geometrically, what it does is measure how close they are in the direction they're pointing to. So if you have two vectors going like this, you're gonna be very, very similar, and the words they represent are gonna mean very similar things, like Python and Anaconda. If you watched my last video, you probably know that I started off by writing a front end for this application, but I kind of got tired of that. A lot of other things got in the way, so I instead decided to just go with a simple Python script to show off that this works, and then if somebody else wants to add a front end, you can just clone my Python script and then add whatever you want to do with it. I don't really care. But we still haven't completely answered our main question. We're gonna take these vector embeddings and then put them into a database so that a large language model can look up the most relevant vector embeddings or the most relevant pieces of code based on a user's input, which will also convert to a vector embedding so we can compare it against the things in our database. But Sid, what exactly is it that you're embedding, you might ask? And that's an excellent question because you can't embed your entire code base because when you get the text for that to put into the ChatGPT API, you're gonna run out of context length because it's still too big. What we need to do is figure out the smallest piece of code that kind of carries the most amount of information. When I was doing it with my AI search engine for my YouTube channel, I did it with sentences. I could have done it with paragraphs as well because paragraphs are a pretty foundational block of the English language and writing in general. You construct essays out of paragraphs and paragraphs are constructed out of sentences and words and then words are constructed out of tokens. But I, using paragraphs makes sense when you're doing something like a wiki page because each paragraph is kind of its own self-contained idea. What's the equivalent to a paragraph in code? Is it a class? Is it a function? Is it a combination of functions? To me, I picked a function. I'm going to embed the functions in this code along with their class name, function header, and function definition because I think that'll be able to give us enough information about what the function is actually meant to do and give ChatGPT enough information to assist us when we ask it questions. But you know, there are probably better ways to do this. Like maybe you can look at the stack of function calls, see what functions are interrelated, and then use that as context into the large language model because then you can get a lot of information for very few tokens, which is the trade-off that you're trying to maximize. And that's really what you wanna do. And I've seen research papers that do something like this. And if I can find them again, I'll leave links to them in the description down below. Before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor, codecrafters.io. One thing I'm a big advocate of is building projects by yourself to gain as much possible relevant programming experience as you possibly can. Following along with tutorials is great, but it's not the best way to grow your skills as a developer. The best way to grow your own skills is to greenfield a project 
start it from scratch and build something complex and education. And Codecrafters.io is there to support you in doing so. On Codecrafters, you can learn how to rebuild really popular developer tools completely from scratch, like Git or Docker in a bunch of different languages. They're not gonna completely hold your hand because that ruins the point of learning, but they're gonna give you all the resources you need to succeed. And if you ever need a little bit more assistance, it's available to you. If you wanna go check it out, use my referral link for a 40% discount, links in the description down below. All right, great. We embed the functions in the code, put them in a the database, then have the large language model look up the relevant functions to answer our questions. Great, that's the implementation in theory. Let's look at a quick example of what this actually looks like after everything has come together. Let's do a quick demo of the actual code system. So we have the Flask repository cloned and ready to go for code assistant to answer any questions on. So let's start off with a very quick free. What repository are we in? And for this, it doesn't actually need to look up any of the code that we've stored in our vector database using all of these embed functions. All it really needs to do is look at the readme that we also supply in the context at the very beginning. And you know, we're in the Flask repository. Awesome. Now I'm gonna ask a, a follow-up question. What is the default port for a Flask application to run? And it'll think, um, and again, it still won't have to look up any code for this, I don't think, 5,000, because I think that's pretty much just basic knowledge and it's probably in GPT's training information. Now we say um, community has decided to override this and make the new default port 5,001. How do we do this in the code? And for this, it should look up relevant code and it is. And what it's doing here is looking at the five most similar pieces of code to our search query within our Chroma database or our vector database supplied by Chroma DB. You can use whatever vector DB you want. It doesn't really matter. You could probably just even use a NumPy array. So we're gonna look up the code, synthesize all the information and come up with a response that hopefully makes sense to us. Um, you know, it's not a hundred percent thing. Sometimes it makes mistakes, but it is what it is. We're using GPT-4, so it's a little bit slower. If you use GPT-3.5 Turbo, you'd get responses a lot quicker, but it might be worse. Okay, so uh, it seems uh, like we've actually figured out a location. Um, to change the default port to 5001 in Flask application, you need to modify the... All right, so Python def run, and we see that it's defined here where the default port is. To override this, uh, I mean, okay. Yeah, so it picks up the relevant part of the code. It doesn't tell us the right thing to do because it's telling us that it's on the user's end to change the default port. But if we look it up, uh, and that's in Flask's app.py, so we can look for app.py um, here. Uh, and we'll look here and we'll look for the code. All right, yeah, boom. So it is able to figure out where the correct code is. It didn't tell us the right change, but that's fine. We're smart enough to know what the right change is to make. So it works, it works okay. Um, it's not the best product because first of all, it's slow um, and it's not always gonna be perfect, but as large language models and code is, as large language models get better in terms of accuracy, it'll get better. And there's a lot of improvements that can be made in the code itself. The main loop is very simple. We take in a user input, um, the user's input is then parsed by GPT-4. GPT-4 then decides, hey, should I be calling the search code base function? And if it is, then it looks at the five most relevant pieces of code and then uses that to synthesize a response to the user's original query. Otherwise, it'll just act as normal GPT-4 and use the information within its context left to answer to the user. We also uh, give GPT-4 all of this information pretty succinctly and keep track of all of the messages that we've gotten so far in order to build out a context left for a bit meaningful conversation. Embedding the project itself is actually quite simple. We just need a vector database um, and then an abstract syntax tree for the Python file we're embedding. We look through the abstract syntax tree to find all of the relevant classes, the relevant functions, uh, or we embed all the functions with their class name and function header and function body. That gives us as much information as I think we need, but there are different ways to do this. Feel free to experiment because I'll be putting this up on GitHub very, very soon. And you can find a link to that in the description of this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, hit that like button, leave a comment and subscribe and meet a ton. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.